Good day, everybody. Um, I'm Justin Kay, Field Specialist in Horticulture with MU Extension, and so happy that you're able to join us for the Garden Hour today. I hope you all have had a little bit of respite from the heat over the past week or so. Hopefully, uh, your plants are able to uh, get a respite and and get some water in them. And uh, so we're, we're looking forward to today's Garden Hour presentation. We have a lot of great topics, a lot of great questions uh, submitted by our viewers, and we're looking forward to getting this thing rolling. So if you're not familiar with who your horticulturist is, um, we have horticulturists that serve every part of the state of Missouri. And so we're kind of all broken up into different counties here and you can see the map. And so just know that we're here as a resource to help you and we're always happy to answer your questions. So um, if you wanna take a moment and jot down the email address of the horticulturist that's serving your county and just know that if your county is labeled as open, just feel free to reach out to one of the neighboring horticulturists and, and we'll all be happy to, to help you out. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to our weather guru and state climatologist, Pat Ganan for the weather report. Sounds good. Thank you, Justin. And, and good afternoon, everyone. I, it's nice to see these past couple of weeks. They've been somewhat a little bit more benign, I think, than what we've been experiencing here in the Show Me State for the summer. And look at some of these temperatures. I use Columbia as a midpoint for the state here on the left. These are daily average high and low temperatures for the month of August in, in the orange line. Those are the average max temperatures and this darker blue line are the average min temperatures. The pink is what we've experienced so far each day of the month here in uh, Columbia, uh, max temperature, and then the lighter blue color are the minimum temperatures. And you can very well see, you know, we started out hot uh, during about the first week or so, but things have really been somewhat uh, more tolerable in regard to the heat and humidity. Uh, we're actually running a little bit below average if you take these last couple of weeks. And so very nice to see these, these calm, clear conditions, lots of dew in the morning on the grass, light winds. It's just been very, very nice considering what it can be like during the latter half of August. On the right, these are the for the month of August. We only have about a week to go, but this, uh, this is what we're seeing in regard to departure from average temperatures are generally running a little about, about average, a little bit below average in Southeast Missouri, a couple areas here in the Northern border counties in Southwest that are running slightly above average. But I think overall, when the month um, comes to an end next week, we're gonna see probably near to below average temperatures statewide for the month of August. That will go down in the record books. For rainfall also, we've been seeing some decent rainfall across some areas that really needed the rain. Some areas of, the, of Southern Missouri have been experiencing drought for most of the summer. And uh, hope, and these, this is rainfall on the left from a radar estimate over the past couple of weeks. And these yellows are two or more inches. So obviously some notable and significant precipitation has impacted a good portion of the state. That being said, there are some areas that have been missing out, especially northeast parts of the state, the extreme northeast corner of Missouri. It's been fairly dry the past couple of weeks. Also bordering Illinois as you go south and southeastward into east central Missouri, a little bit drier conditions, at least for rainfall over the past two weeks. Also a little bit of a dry pocket here north of um, Joplin and south of Kansas City. We see here right around um, Oh, Vernon County and Cedar County and over into Barton County, a little bit dry and as well as in Southeast Missouri. On the right, these are actual totals from rain gauges using the Kokoros rain gauges across the state over the past couple of weeks. And you can see these heavier totals in the greens. Uh, again, some badly needed precipitation, especially over about the Southern uh, half of Missouri where it's been dry for much of the summer. So it's nice to get a little bit of relief and starting to see those uh, lawns, those, those brown lawns starting to green up again with precipitation and these nicer temperatures that we're seeing. It does look like another uh, Chamber of Commerce day today in regard to this weather, very sunny conditions, generally highs in the mid 80s. That's just about average for this time of year. There are indications of a cold front in Iowa that will be sinking down into Northern Missouri as we go into tomorrow. That will bring some scattered chances of showers and thunderstorms, especially across the northeast quarter of the state. I do believe most people will miss out, but nonetheless, there will be some showers likely popping up sometime tomorrow across especially northeastern parts of Missouri. 
These are the temperatures that'll take us through the weekend, low and high temperatures. And you can see these pleasant temperatures continuing. It's nice to see low temperatures in the 60s this time of year. We're exper gonna experience that tomorrow morning as well as Friday morning, Saturday morning, maybe a little bit warmer with more cloud cover on Sunday across the state, generally in the upper 60s and low 70s on Sunday morning. These are the high temperatures as we go into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Again, very pleasant, seasonable conditions, generally in the mid 80s on Friday and Saturday, mid to upper 80s as we go into Sunday with our uh, best chances of precipitation actually being on Sunday statewide. This is the outlook over the next seven days. They are indication of course, indicating, of course, that little that weak front impacting perhaps north and north central, northeast and north central Missouri tomorrow. I think better, more widespread chances will be coming on Sunday, Monday, and on into Tuesday of next week. So uh, these are the totals they're anticipating over the next seven days, generally about an inch to an inch and a half. It looks like the heavier totals across far southwestern Missouri, perhaps as much as one and a half to two inches. So that will be nice considering actually it's been dry over the past week generally across the state. And here we will be ending the month of August with perhaps some more above average precipitation, especially starting on Sunday and on into midweek next week. This is the forecast for next week showing near uh, normal temperatures that generally, especially are indicated across Southwest Missouri, maybe a little bit slightly enhanced likelihood of above normal temperatures across the rest of the state. And on the right, this is the greens are indicative of that unsettled weather that we're anticipating on Sunday and on into Monday and Tuesday and perhaps even into Wednesday with an enhanced likelihood of above normal precipitation as we go through next week. Justin, that's pretty much a weather report. I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Pat. Well, um, somewhat moderate temperatures and some rainfall in the forecast that that all sounds pretty good for this time of year. So. Uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to our moderator, Kelly McGowan, to get us started on the questions for today. All right. Thank you, Justin. Okay. Well, thank you to all who submitted questions and photos this week. Um, continue to do so. Those are um, really helpful to have those questions ahead of time. So feel free to submit those, and uh, we will certainly get to them if we can. So our first question for today is about uh, canning tomatoes. And the question is, do I have to remove all of the white core before canning tomatoes? Uh, Eli, what do you think about this? Can you guys hear me now? Sorry about that. Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to answer this question. Um, uh, canning is not one of my specialties. I've done some of it in the past. And uh, yesterday I had a talk with our uh, nutrition folks about how to can safely and how to answer this question. And um, of course, here's a, a picture of one of my favorite things to can this time of year, which is uh, salsa. So. Eli, we lost your audio there, sir. How about that? Sounds good. Yeah, sorry about that. So the issue that we're talking about is white core in tomatoes, and this is caused by excessive heat, improper fertility. You'll find this more in your older tomato varieties, and uh, newer beefsteak types tend to show less. Um, and uh, one of the ways to deal with it, uh, you can't really change the heat unless maybe you put up some shade structure uh, to maintain a fertility program with ample amounts of potassium. But what is ample amounts? I think this is where it comes in to get your garden soil tested so you can get an idea of what you need to do so you don't have to deal with this in the future. But uh, here is now and we have white corn in our tomatoes. What are we gonna do when we wanna can it and make that salsa or whatever else you wanna make out of that uh, uh, summer freshness? Um, So to answer your question, do I need to core my tomatoes? You gotta, it depends. You gotta follow the tested recipe. When, um, where do I get tested recipes? Of course, uh, you know, wouldn't you know at the MU extension, we have nutrition and health program. We provide tested recipes. Um, these recipes are tested at the National Center for Home Food Preservation. I think they're down at University of Georgia and they also provide recipes, tested recipes. And you can also get them from the Ball Canning Corporation. And um, 
all these tested recipes that I looked through, I looked through a bunch of them yesterday. Um, it says you need to core your tomatoes, but you need to follow what it says in the recipe that's tested to make sure you have a food safe product. The, the big concern with uh, tomatoes is uh, botulism. And uh, you can see um, in this recipe, they got lemon or lime juice and most tomato recipes now will have some sort of acidifier. Um, the issue with uh, the white core is that the pH in the white core rises compared to the rest of the tomato. And so if you put it in there, um, your uh, acidity, your pH may be too high and it couldn't make uh, conditions correct or right for uh, pathogens to grow that would make you sick. Um, so another thing that they, they point out is you don't want to uh, can tomatoes from dead or frost killed vines. That's because of, also because of that uh, pH issue. And uh, you can go ahead and can green tomatoes as long as you follow the, as long as you follow the recipe. Um, I really hope nobody's trying to can those tomatoes up there in the top right. That's pretty bad. Um, here's some links. I'll stick them in the chat. Um, that's what I got. Thank you. All right. Great information. Thank you, Eli. You made me hungry seeing all that salsa. Okay. Uh, the next question is um, about pawpaw trees. And the question is, uh, we have a small grove of pawpaw trees that recently started showing yellow leaves. Um, the tips of the branches are curling and drying up. The trees are in the woods far enough away from the house where they get no additional water besides rain. The yellow leaves have all dropped to the ground and the dried leaves will hang on to the tree. Up until recently, all these pawpaw trees were green and looking healthy. There are some photos. Um, this all happened in the past two weeks. What's happening here and can it be prevented? So let's take a look at these photos and let me pull those up here. Okay, so here's the photos that were submitted and you can see the little pawpaw grove um, out in this wooded area and so some of us have, have looked at these pictures and we've talked about these pictures and this is very likely just drought stress. We are seeing lots and lots of trees and shrubs that are really struggling with this excessive heat and drought this summer. And this is what it looks like. They just start to, um, some of the leaves start to yellow, they start to die, and then you get secondary issues like insects moving in and starting to build webs. And that's likely the webbing that we're seeing here in this um, one picture. But, you know, pawpaws are a native tree to Missouri, so they are pretty acclimated to periods of dry weather. And so while they may be dropping leaves right now, they're likely still alive and will be just fine going into next spring. If you do go into next spring and you don't see the trees leafing out like they normally do, reach out to one of us. We can send a sample into our plant diagnostic clinic and test for disease. But in this case, I really think it's just drought stress and these trees will be just fine. So thank you for sending those pictures in. Okay, our next question is also along the lines of drought issues. And this question is um, just kind of an observation as this person's out walking their dog every day. They're seeing a lot of juniper landscaping trees turning brown and dying. And this is in Southwest Missouri in the Springfield and Nixa area. And the question is, do you know what's going on? Um, so Kathy is going to take this question and um, talk to us a little bit about that. I need to be made um, a co-host, I think. All right. Oh, it says host. Okay, yeah, it says you're a host. Let me see if this works. I was the first one on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. That's okay. We can see it now. Okay. <laughs> Just trying to get to, whoops. Okay. 
well, I haven't done this in a while. So uh, just go uh, to view, go to view. Uh, oh, right. That's right. Put there uh, yes. In reading uh, view. Yes. Something was hiding it. Okay. Yeah. There we go. All right. So uh, yes, the uh, injury on um, from drought. Well, what I was going to say is without pictures, it is hard to tell exactly what's going on with those junipers she's seeing. Um, but with this extreme uh, heat and dry conditions, uh, those temperatures over 90 degrees, drought stress could certainly be the problem. Now, this picture we're looking at is uh, not those junipers. This is a um, uh, injury on a conifer, and it's uh, from Montana, Montana State University. So lack of moisture and high temperatures are hard on all plants, but um, with the uh, needled evergreens, it takes longer to show up. So you don't, sometimes you don't see it right away. Eventually those, those needles will start dropping and you'll see the browning and the yellowing like you do in this picture, but the damage could have been done months or even years earlier and the effects are just showing up now. And so this spring, um, when uh, some of the effects may come up, you may start seeing some of the effects from the drought that we're receiving now. So, um, so this seems um, uh, like we say this often, but water is so critical. And so even with well-established plants and when, and when conditions are so extreme and those feeder roots uh, die or, or get uh, are affected, then it can take weeks for the uh, root hairs to regrow. And we put a couple of links in the chat that really go into more detail about what is happening to your plants during drought. And then also some of the things that you can do um, to help, uh, help your plants get through this. I wanted to show this picture as well. Kelly sent it to me, and these are green giant arborvitae, and these, and you can see um, that these plants just have completely died, and uh, the ones on either side of it are, might be showing effects of it, um, and so now's the time to try to save those for sure to get water on them. And uh, she also sent me uh, pictures of a willow, and um, so this is what it looks like when it in high temperatures and uh, no moisture. I wanted to mention too, like I said, we didn't have pictures of the juniper. So there are, uh, and junipers are considered a pretty tough plant, but there are uh, uh, diseases and pests that can affect them. And one of them is scale. And here's a picture of a uh, scale on a juniper. And you can, if you can see that at the tip of the plant and a little uh, right underneath that dead at the tip is, or that browning at the tip are little white egg shaped spots. And those are the scale. So you've really got to uh, get in there and look for those. So spider mites also affect junipers. However, the spruce spider mite uh, doesn't like hot weather like most mites do. But so they're uh, going to do their damage in the spring. So some of this could have been from spite, uh, uh, from that damage as well, uh, spider mite damage, um, but just not sure at this time of the year whether it was or not. So just remember that the healthier your plants are, well watered, well taken care of, the less likely they are going to suffer from the drought and the secondary um, symptoms and things like the spider mites and um, other diseases and the um, <laughs> scale. So that's all I have, Kelly. All right, thank you, Kathy. Okay, our next question is on raised beds. And the question is, um, can you share some information about some economical and long lasting materials to make a raised bed at home? And Justin is gonna share some information with us on that. Awesome, thanks Kelly. And thanks for um, submitting the question. Um, sometimes economical and long lasting don't go hand in hand, but uh, I wanted to, go over some of the materials commonly used for, for raised bed construction. Uh, if you haven't used raised beds before, there's there's a reason why people utilize them. 
Um, they, they get the plants up off the ground, have much improved drainage, especially if you're in a heavier clay soil, for instance. Um, they're generally filled and amended and the, with an improved soil. And so you got really good root penetration, potentially higher yields. They also warm up quicker in the spring. So that soil warms up more rapidly than the soil in the ground. So you could have um, seeds that are germinating more quickly, for instance, like some of your early spring direct seeded crops and warmer, warmer uh, soil for rooted transplants. Um, they're a lot easier to work with in terms of stooping and bending. They can be a lot more comfortable to work with over time. Um, you can also, you know, you have this tidy appearance in a yard. So, you know, if you if you're concerned about that, they they look really appealing in the landscape, and they can also be used on rooftops and patios and and other areas, even where folks just have concrete um, or some other material underneath there. So when we're thinking about raised bed materials, we need to think about, you know, what definitely not to use, and so old treated lumber, um, chromated copper arsenate was was treated with that, and that has a bunch of chemicals that we don't want to get into our garden. Um, but also things like railroad ties, which can be, you know, commonly found cheap or used um, or treated with creosote as well as utility poles. So you want to avoid things like that. Um, and then there is a, it's called pentatreated lumber. The active chemical is pentochlorophenol. And that's another one that that we should be avoiding for raised bed materials. Um, I just mentioned this one. I went to pick up a bunch of uh, cinder blocks, cement blocks one time because I wanted to build uh, some raised beds and when I got there it was from a foundation and they were covered in paint um, and you know likely if it's old paint it's lead paint so just keep that in mind. There are newer wood treatments and there's a fair amount of information um, on some of these newer wood treatments. The most common one is ACQ uh, up on the top there, alkaline copper quaternary and most of these, your wood in theory should have a tag um, stapled to the bottom of it that tells you, you what it's treated for and, and what it can be used for. And so I found some, some pretty good information from some universities. Um, all of these are copper based. And so the first one, there's been some studies shown that this one's pretty much non-toxic by normal dermal and oral exposure. So, you know, if you're touching the raised bed and then touching your mouth kind of thing or getting that um, in your mouth, it's shown to be pretty much non-toxic. The second one, um, probably a less common wood treatment, it has been shown that it could cause toxic exposure to children, um, but essentially they would have to be touching the raised beds and then it made it sound like they'd have to be, you know, essentially licking their hands to get that residue um, into their body. But, you know, just some things to, to think about here. The last one um, has shown that it doesn't really move through soils too well. So, you know, not necessarily like super conclusive research on all of this, but a, a study of these different wood treatments showed that the amount of residue in soils were 10 to 100 times lower than what's considered toxic to humans. And it should be noted that, you know, copper is a naturally existing element. Plants do need, uh, it's one of the essential nutrients for plant growth. Um, but if you are uh, still concerned about using these options, um, you could you could paint them or stain them with oil-based stain. You could also put a plastic liner between the soil and wood just to kind of remove any potential for contact there. But, um, you know, I know there's a lot of materials out there don't use treated lumber for raised beds. A lot of that points back to some of the arsenate products. Um, there are some new some new wood treatments out there uh, that are that are mainly copper based. So I know a lot of folks like to use cinder, cement, and concrete blocks. One potential concern is these may contain fly ash, and unfortunately, there's not labeling on cinder blocks that tells you whether fly ash was used. And unfortunately, there's not really any studies on whether or not these will leach heavy metals into the soil because fly ash is a, is a coal byproduct and it does contain heavy metals. So um, an option to prevent soil contact would be using a, a polymer based paint or a, a plastic liner between the blocks in the soil for, for these types of materials. And, and these types of materials are probably going to be um, 
some of the ones that you're going to find most readily available used for purchase, which may be a, a cheap option. Another option would be to use an untreated lumber product that's a decay resistant species. So when we think about what's decay resistant, um, I have a list up top there. Um, Osage Orange is kind of the standout. It is, a, it is an expensive lumber um, and not necessarily widely available at the big box stores, but cedar is very rot resistant and is, is widely available as well. Um, there are some oak species listed up there, but most oak available at big box stores is, is red oak, so not necessarily as decay resistant as some of those uh, types of oak that are listed up there. Uh, cedar and redwood, those are probably your most commonly available woods that are on that list up there. And you definitely, you don't want to use pine because um, it really has no rot resistance and will decay um, rather quickly, especially in our humid environment with with a lot of rain and, and humidity so those recycled plastic timbers um, are also an option um, not necessarily the cheapest option but they they will last uh, a really really long time so one thing to consider um, we do have a really great forest product industry in the state of missouri and so mdc has a great website where you can find lumber mills um, in your area and so one thing that I did uh, when I ran a little vegetable farm, I wanted to make a really big raised bed for growing uh, lettuce mix. And so I think I built, it was about a hundred feet long, uh, about seven to eight inches tall. And I did that all with what's called side cuts or slab cuts from milling logs. And so I just have a picture on the side there. It's not necessarily a clean, perfect piece of lumber, um, but for about 20 bucks, um, I was able to fill up the bed of my truck with some of these cedar slabs. So they're, they're very rot resistant. So that could be an option for you. Um, and, and those cedar, Osage, orange, bur oak, white oak, those may be available from, from a local lumber mill, whether you're looking for, you know, a slab waste product or, um, you know, milled, milled lumber. So in terms of you know, ways that we can reduce costs, um, you could check with your local lumber mills. Generally, a business that's a lumber yard or a lumber supplier um, is probably gonna be cheaper than big box stores. So you might wanna check with them and see um, you know, if, they, if they sell to consumers or if they have order minimum, but if you can get something from a lumber yard or a lumber supplier in your area, it's probably gonna be cheaper than, than a big box store. Um, you know, we have a lot of great online marketplaces now um, where you can get leftover construction materials, you know, for probably a much reduced cost than you would if you're purchasing them new. Um, thing, things like timber blocks and clay bricks, um, you know, used cattle troughs. They also make galvanized fire rings like this. Um, if you want to stay really cheap, you can use just a temporary raised bed where we're just kind of digging and mounding the soil. Um, above the ground. It's going to give you some of the benefits of a, a framed raised bed, not quite as much soil warming and probably not quite as much drainage, but that is also an option. And it's it's going to give you a little bit better drainage and um, root growth than if you, if you planted kind of directly in the ground. Um, you know, as opposed to building a bunch of raised beds with lumber that's not necessarily of desirable quality, you could just go ahead and start with uh, a small raised bed and kind of expand as as you grow. Um, and I want to thank um, one of our master gardeners from St. Charles County, Kevin Menard, who uh, provided some of these pictures for me today. So that is all I have on raised beds. All right. Thank you, Justin. Okay, so next we are going to move into horticulture terminology. And uh, Debbie, what do you have for us today? Yeah, so I have the term frass, and I'd like for you all, I'm going to start the poll here um, as soon as I can find it. Okay, can somebody else help me? I know I found it under more. And, oh, there it is, poll. Sorry, guys. Okay, so I've launched the poll. So frass, is it insect excrement, a specific name for insect leg segments? are a generic term for insect damage on a plant. And so I've got folks that are answering. I'm seeing answers coming in. 
I'll give you just a few more minutes for those who would like to kind of guess at it. If you're not sure what it is, don't worry. Nobody knows if you put in a wrong answer or not. This is all for fun and to learn. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now. And I'm gonna share the results. So the results are showing that 60% of you that answered said A, insect excrement. 16% say a specific name for an insect leg segment. And 24% say it's a generic term for insect damage on a plant. And I'm going to show you the answer is actually frost or frost rather is an insect excrement or in other words, insect feces or insect poop. Um, and it will look different from one insect to the next, depending upon that specific insect. It can be seen in multiples of different colors, including from yellow to black to brown. Um, here is a picture of an example of what it could look like um, on there. So if you see a lot of, of black or brown or yellow spots, it could be on the top of the leaf. It could be on the underside of the leaf. It could be where the petiole connects to the branch. Lots of different things are locations as to where you can also see see the frass. Sometimes if it's a wood burrowing type of an insect, it might look like a hole and sawdust is coming out of that hole. Um, so there's different things that you could look at to kind of figure out if it's really a uh, frass or not. Um, but it is a term that we use in horticulture and one that I thought I would share with you. Um, this link that's down here on, on the bottom of the page, and I'll, I'll drop that into the chat box. I forgot to add it in for Eli to add. Um, does have a good explanation of frass and all the different things that you really want to learn about insect poop. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Okay, well, switching gears from poop to something very tasty, <laughs> we are next going to talk about something that is in season and is readily available, and that is peaches. Let me get this pulled up. Okay, so peaches are in season right now, and they are showing up, at least in this area, in the southwest Missouri area, they're showing up in roadside stands and grocery stores and farmers markets and just all kinds of places. So let's talk a little bit about fresh peaches. Well, they are in season, they are starting to show up around the area, but they're not only delicious, but they're good for us as well. They contain vitamins, A and C, they contain potassium, they're a good source of fiber, and a medium peach is only 40 calories. So if you've got uh, a hankering for something sweet, this is a lot better than a candy bar. So we can grow peaches in Missouri. Lots and lots of people do. Just be aware that peaches bloom in early spring. And more often than not, spring frost can kill those blooms and then in turn destroy crops. So do keep that in mind if you want to try to grow peaches in your own backyard. Peaches are susceptible to several different types of disease. So if you are planting a new tree, make sure that you plant a resistant cultivar. We have some really good guide sheets through MU Extension on choosing a cultivar for Missouri. So definitely check that out, not just for peach trees, but any kind of fruit trees. And do be aware that although it is a resistant cultivar, it's not 100% resistant, and you may still need a spray program. Um, there's sometimes a myth that growing backyard fruit trees is easy, but, you know, there's, there's some things you need to keep in mind. There's a lot of maintenance to, that goes into having fruit trees. They have to be pruned. They have to be trained. There has to be fruit thinning done. And then, of course, spray. And um, we also have a really good MU extension guide on um, a fruit spray schedule for the homeowner that is very helpful as well. So, so take a look at that. 
But maybe the easiest thing to do is just to buy peaches from someone, some of our local farmers, support some of our local farmers. And when you go to, to buy peaches, you want to look for an even background color. And for yellow peaches, you want a good golden color. And for white peaches, you want kind of a creamy background color. If there's green around the stem, that, ends, that indicates that they're not quite ripe yet. So do keep that in mind. Feel for a slight give to the flesh. You don't want it rock hard and you don't want it mushy. And also keep in mind that peaches bruise very easily, so handle with care. And one of my new favorite ways to eat peaches is grilling them and drizzling with honey. Um, there's many good ways to enjoy peaches, but this is something that we've been doing a lot at our house this summer, and it is absolutely delicious. Okay, so hopefully that got you hungry for some peaches. And our next thing that we are going to talk about is cucumbers and zucchini, another summertime staple. And Pong is going to tell us a little bit about some issues that he's seen with these things. Thank you, Kelly. You really made me hungry. It's, I didn't have a lunch here. And especially when I posted the first slide showing food, I feel more hungry now. All right, uh, my name is Peng Tian. I'm the director of the MU Plant Diagnostic Clinic. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, you may wonder why I chose uh, this title, the powdered sugar versus cotton candy. Uh, actually, it is because that uh, these two names are what I name the two common diseases of cucurbits. Uh, one is called uh, Phytophthora fruit rot, which are showing in this photo, looks like they have some powdered sugar on the surface of rotten uh, cucumber. And the other disease is called a cottony leak disease. Looks like they got some cotton candy on the surface on the zucchini squash. Um, let's do um, um, one by one for those diseases. I begin with uh, beginning with the uh, Phytophthora. Uh, Phytophthora blight and the fruit rot, uh, this disease, if you look at this word, it's a little bit hard to pronounce it. Let me slow it down, slow down. Uh, Phytophthora, so Phytophthora. Phytophthora blight and the fruit rot. It can cause symptoms such as the crown rot and also the rotting fruits covered with a layer of the white and powdered mold. This, uh, this disease, is caused by Phytophthora capacity or other Phytophthora species. It can cause issues for most of cucurbits, family plants, and peppers. Uh, they favor uh, the warm and uh, wet weather, and uh, especially right after the heavy rain uh, with, uh, uh, with the appropriate temperature, it will intensify the damage and uh, promote those progression of this disease. If you look at the, the, um, the sample under a microscope, uh, you can see if you focus on those powdered sugar, what I call um, in under a microscope, you can see uh, the fruiting body of this pathogen. Uh, this is actually a not a fungus. It is called oomycetes, which is a fungus-like organism. They have some um, really distinctive difference between uh, from the fungus. So such as the sporangia in contrast with the canidia of the fungus. You can see those here under microscope and each of them, once they get mature, inside of the sporangia, they can produce the zoo spores, which is another type of spores that it can swim in the water, transmit a disease from plants to plants. And uh, as long as you have this disease, it can cause really fast fruit rotting. And over time, you will have a party of different uh, rotten and pathogens. For example, in this photo, you can see not only the Phytophthora spores, as well as the Alternaria spores. And you can see the whole photo with filled with really small, tiny uh, particles. They are actually bacteria. So with all those pathogens, 
the uh, the fruits can um, can become rotten really fast. So in for uh, the disease management, uh, since this is a soil borne disease um, and this pathogen can exist in the soil for extended period of time, so you will need to select a site without history of the soil borne diseases. Sanitation is really important for prevention of the disease. You may need to select some disease free soil and also get rid of the disease plant as soon as you spot them in the field. Crop rotation is also really important, very useful. Uh, you should uh, avoid planting the same type of plants uh, for a couple of years so that I can reduce the disease pressure uh, in the field. Irrigation is really important. You should avoid irrigating with uh, com contaminated water, uh, over irrigation, as well as the watering during the harvest time. Resistant variety is very useful uh, in controlling this disease. Sometimes it can reduce the severity from 30% to 50%. There are some chemical available that it can be used to spray uh, for controlling this, um, this disease. I have a couple of uh, fact sheets uh, and also disease facts uh, link in the chat, uh, chat box. You can uh, find the chemical uh, control uh, recommendations in those, uh, in those links. In contrast to Phytophthora fruit uh, rot, let's talk about the cotton candy disease. It's called a cottony leak disease. It can cause the fruit rotting with white cottony mycelium growth uh, near or uh, in contact with the soil. And this is caused by Pythium species, which is another uh, organism of the Umycetes. And uh, it can affect most of the cucurbits plants. In contrast to, to the Phytophthora fruit rot, I would say the cottony leak disease it can cause a less severe um, disease um, um, damage to the plants. Uh, you can see this is the uh, disease plant on the uh, zucchini squash. Under microscope, uh, there's slight difference. If you look at the sporangia, they are uh, round in contrast to lemon shaped sporangia of the Phytophthora fruit rot. Disease control. Um, in addition to what I have mentioned for disease management for Phytophthora, um, they are basically very similar. Uh, and you please select a site with a good drainage and use sufficient plant spacing, uh, as well as using the practice that can create a barrier between the fruits and the soil so that it can reduce the opportunities for them to get contaminated. Um, in the end of this talk, there's a bonus. Let's talk black cotton candy. This is a fungal disease, different with the previous two, which is Umaisi disease. It's called a chana, chanafra fruit rot. It can cause the white, the fluffy or furry mycelium can start with white, then purplish black uh, fungal growth. And on the top of each, each I would say, uh, stalk, uh, there are fungal spores on the top, which is shown to be the, in the color of the black. And uh, that's how they transmit from plant to plant. It can affect the, um, the family of the cucurbits and high humidity and high temperature is uh, um, really uh, preferred for this uh, the development and progression of the, this disease. So that's all I have uh, for uh, the three diseases for cucurbits. Um, thank you so much. I get back to you, Kelly. All right. Thank you, Pong. Okay, so our next question is about cucumber leaves turning yellow. And the question is, what could be the issue? And so Debbie is going to take this question. But before she does, um, we're going to have a little bit of extra time once she presents this topic. So if you have questions that you would like to ask, Go ahead and put those in the chat and then we will get to those afterwards. So Debbie. Thank you. So this, um, I got a phone call from uh, someone in my county. She's a new beginning gardener and she was curious as to why her cucumber leaves were turning yellow. I asked her to send me a couple of pictures and she did a great job. I wanted to see what a couple of the plants looked like so I could compare from one plant to another. And I asked for the top part of the leaf picture 
and an underside of the leaf picture. And she did that and did that mighty fine. So we're trying to figure out what actually is going on with the cucumbers. So we need to look at the pictures as she sent to me. And then we also have to think about what is occurring with the weather? How was she caring for the plants? Um, all of those things that, that come into play that we need to ask whenever someone says what's going on with my plants. And through some deduction, we finally decided that it is damage that is appearing from the two spotted spider mite. And so here on the two pictures, you see a close up of what the spider mite looks like and why it's called the two spotted. It has the two black spots there um, next to it. It looks awfully large, but those are the eggs of a spider mite. This is a real close up under a microscope. Um, so spider mites are very, very small and they can be very hard to detect at times, but they have two spots. They love the weather when it's hot and it's dry. And most of our state has been in somewhat of a drought like condition or severe drought, depending upon where you're at. Or if you're fortunate in the Northern part of the state, you haven't had the drought this year. The coloration of spider mites can be anywhere from brown to a red, to a green, to a cream colored, but they all of them will have at least two spots on them. Some of the damage that you'll see is you'll see yellow stippling, speckling or spots that are on the actual foliage itself. If it becomes a heavy infestation of spider mites, you're actually going to see where the leaves are going to turn yellow, they'll turn brown, they'll have a bronze coloration to them. And at one point, if it's really bad, those leaves are actually going to drop from the plant. So you can see by looking at this picture where she took it so I could see uh, the plants in general, I could really tell what was happening there. So as a closer up look, you can see here there's some webbing where the leaf actually is attaching to the stem. And then you can see the speckling or the stippling and how it actually is starting to turn a little bronze color in some of those different areas. So what we really want to look for is the, sp the two spotted spider mite lives on the underside of the leaves. And so it can, if especially with a heavy infestation, there can be some webbing. So you can look for that. Um, it does have a life cycle of about seven to 10 days. So it lays its eggs and within three or four days, it hatches, it becomes mature, and then it starts laying eggs all over again. So it's pretty prolific once the weather gets to be what we've had and been experiencing most recently. To figure out if it's really spider mites, you can take that leaf and turn it over to see if you can see some little tiny spots that might look like they're moving. Um, if they are spots and you're looking at it for a while and they start to move, chances are it could be spider mites. What you could do is take a white piece of paper, put it on the underside of the leaf, and then just kind of tap on that leaf pretty hard, not enough to break the leaf, of course, but pat on that pretty hard. And then those spider mites might become loose and detach themselves from the bottom side of the leaf and then they'll drop down onto that white piece of paper and then you can look at it and if they start moving then you know that it's probably going to be a spider mite it, there'll be really small spots there if they drop down and they don't move then chances are it's going to be the frass and yeah i spelt that wrong on the other slide i apologize um but if they're crawling around on the paper then you know that that they're probably the spider mites they do have a tendency to move from one plant to another because they're so small. If they're loosened from the leaf, they will go ahead and catch the wind. <laughs> Excuse me. And then that's how they move from one plant to the next. They do overwinter as an adult or they can also overwinter as eggs. So they, they can overwinter in two different stages of their life cycle. So here is again, a picture of the leaf that she sent to me, we couldn't really see anything or uh, black accumulations of anything or dark accumulation spots on the underside of the leaf. But we had some rain recently. So chances are that it could have been washed off. Um, on the left side of this picture, we're seeing actual the underside of a leaf that's showing some of the different spider mites and some of their frass as well and some of their eggs so that you could actually see it. And that is um, under like a microscope, but not a, a depth 
of a huge electron microscope, but you can actually see that. You can take your own magnifying glass and look on the underside of the leaves as well. So how can we control spider mites? Um, well, we can't control the weather, but there are things that we could and have capability of being able to control. So we wanna keep our plants from stress. And you've heard that earlier today when we when uh, Kathy was talking about uh, junipers, when Kelly was talking about the pawpaws, keep plants from stress. So if we know that it's warm and it's hot and it's dry, let's make sure that we water our plants well and appropriately. Let's also make sure that we've got good fertilization in the soil. So we wanna make sure that we do a, a a soil test so that we can check to see that we have the appropriate nutrients for the type of plants that we're actually growing. You could use a forceful water spray on the underside of those leaves. I would recommend doing that earlier in the day. Uh, that way it gives the plant time to dry out and, and that will loosen those spider mites and they'll drop to the ground. So you may wanna do that on a kind of ongoing basis until you can kind of see that they may not be there as, as often. A, a, a biological control, we can actually um, buy some predator insects. There are places that you can purchase those over the internet. Ones that actually do uh, go after spider mites are ladybugs, lacewing larvae, the minute pirate bugs, and then there are some predatory mites that are out there as well that you might be interested in. And you can just release those in your garden area. Uh, there's no guarantee they're going to stay in your garden, so you need to make sure that you understand that concept, but you can purchase some of these predators as well. When it comes to the chemical control, you can use insecticidal soaps. Make sure that you get the underside of those leaves really well. You can use 2% solution horticultural oils, and again, make sure you get the underside of those leaves covered pretty well. And then you can use miticides. Um, but we have to be careful with the miticides if we're continuously using them. The, the mites can become resistant to some of those different chemicals if we continue to use them on an ongoing basis. Um, so we just need to think about taking care of our plants well, treating them well, using biological controls and using our chemical controls as our last effort. And those are good integrated pest management practices. And that's all that I have on the spider mites. All right, thank you, Debbie. Okay, does anyone um, in the audience have any questions? Just put those in the chat if you do. And if not, we will close out a little early today. Okay, well, Justin, it's kind of quiet, so I'll just turn it back over to you to go ahead and close us out. All right. Thanks, um, Kelly. Justin, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Somebody did raise their hand, um, so I don't know if that was someone who wanted to ask a question. Oh, uh, that was me. Th this is one. Um, so Justin talked about the different materials uh, that you use for raised bed gardens, and I remember I just wanted to add that someone one time asked me about using um, tires, like car tires, for raised bed gardens, and there's evidence that you shouldn't be doing that um, because if you think about the tires the environment there they are you get the the dust from the brake pads and the brakes that that, that, may, that may contain heavy metals and also those tires may be sitting on um oil leaks from the cars and there might be some hydrocarbons in there and if you use those tires to grow crops eventually those compounds are going to leach into the soil and the plants can absorb that so yeah, you could use them for ornamental plants, but I do not recommend using them for edible crops. Yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Thanks, Juan. That's a excellent recommendation. I appreciate that. Yeah. And Justin, we did have one last question come in, a question about bitter cucumbers. Do you want to take that one or do you want me to? <laughs> uh, you can go ahead, Kelly, if you don't mind. All right. Well, bitter cucumbers is uh, due to um, fluctuations in water. It can be excess heat. Um, those are usually the top two things it is. So again, it's probably due to these extreme temperatures and drought that we've had this summer. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. 
So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, if you would like to save some of the helpful links in the chat, I know we put a lot in there over the course of the hour, but a lot of really great information from MU Extension and other universities. Um, you can just hover down over these three dots here and click that chat and save that file for future use. We also want to let you know that we do live stream on YouTube. Um, on our MU IPM YouTube channel, we have a lot of snippets where we pull out um, different topics that were discussed. And then you can also view um, the full garden hour as well. So we're going to continue um, our schedule here from noon to, to 1 p.m. And we always really appreciate your questions. Your questions um, are a great way to get some of the problems that are going on in the landscape that probably other gardeners are dealing with and then kind of bring them to the forefront and then we can discuss them uh, on the garden hour. And you can use that ipm.missouri.edu town halls to sign up for, for future garden hours and submit your questions as well. And so this is what it looks like here. Um, just a real simple sign up and there's an option now to attach pictures. The pictures are something we really appreciate because um, it, it oftentimes gives us much better insight into what's going on than, than just a, a text question. And last but not least, um, just know that we're here to help across the state of Missouri and serve Missourians and know that there's a horticulturist um, either in your county or a neighboring county that's always happy to give you a, a hand with your gardening questions. And we thank you for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of your week.